tonight's uh, hobby enhancement is a lovely uh, red truck porter from uh, one of our many, many locals. And uh, tonight, it's some slow television. I'm making some uh, buildings from the Warhammer Townscape. Now, oh, I'll be getting into some more of that, I think. <clears throat> Now, a few, uh, a couple of months ago, you might have noticed some kindly soul when posted the PDF for the old Warhammer Townscape. This uh, used to, I think, be a cardstock pack that you buy, uh, it's printed off in a print press, uh, but it's since been PDF'd and um, I've been occupying the odd uh, evening by uh, making it all. I thought uh, I'd actually had no intention of uh, building an entire town of uh, papercraft buildings, but um, it suddenly appeared in my uh, feed, and I thought, what the hell? So my other projects are on hold while I uh, spend uh, four or five nights a week churning out some of the, uh, God, how many is it? 30 or 40 odd bloody buildings that I've got in this thing. And tonight, we're doing building number 33, a gabled house. Now this, um, this pack of goodness goes back to um, 1988. And I've noticed a few things while I've been uh, assembling these buildings. Real old-fashioned hobbyist stuff here. The um, I've printed these off onto um, 200 GSM paper because I couldn't be stuffed printing it off a of normal paper and gluing it onto card and then having to muck around with the, waiting for the glue dry and then uh, building it from there. Two hundred uh, GSM paper I've mucked around with a bit before, and uh, nine buildings out of ten is perfectly strong for what you've actually got to work with. Uh, you can um, use foam core to make buildings stronger if you're actually going to be putting a lot of lead miniatures on top of them. But uh, unless you're going to accidentally crush your um, your buildings, or you're going to put an old-fashioned uh, Great demon on a balcony or something, then uh, 200 GSM paper will generally do the trick. And it's a sign of the luxurious times we live in that you can firstly choose your paper weight for your printing, and secondly, have a printer that will actually take paper other than some sort of dot matrix crap on a Sprocket roller feed. And the resolution that we get out of our printers these days is just beggar's belief. This is science fiction compared to uh, what they had to work with back when this was actually designed. You can see it in um, there's a few telltale marks in this to show how it was made. So none of this is computer designed, of course, the technology wasn't that good back in 88. So somebody's gone along and drawn these with a pencil and they've gotten out the inks and the paints, all done it by hand, cut out the individual pieces and they've laid it uh, on a um, blank surface and done what they call repro photography, where you lay it flat, you put your camera above on a stand, some lighting in from either side, and you take a photo of it. And that photo is then turned into a, a photographic plate uh, in order to produce the same image through an old fashioned uh, roller um, print press. So this would have been run through a print press on, uh, on card. And you can tell it's repro photography because there's these little marks around the edges here and there, which are actually shadow. When they photographed it, the 
bit of uh, paper that has been lifted like a half a mil or so off of the uh, whatever it's resting on and you can see the shadow from the lighting has been picked up by the camera transferred to the photographic plate uh, and then printed out and of course somebody's PDF'd it along the way and, uh, and that's what we're working with now and uh, Normally I'm mucking around with plastic kits or uh, old-fashioned white metal miniatures. And you know, when I was a, uh, a younger lad, and they used to throw in the odd cardstock building and starter sets like the uh, old 4th edition Warhammer or the 2nd uh, edition uh, Warhammer 40,000. I remember turning my nose up at those, thinking, why would you want to use paper cardstock buildings when I can spend all Saturday afternoon building a single balsa wood ruin and then painting it up with all sorts of lovely effects. But now that I'm a middle-aged professional and parent, I have to say, sitting around for an evening, with a beer. Ugh. A bit of scissors and glue. It's actually a very relaxing way of going about making terrain. And what with life commitments being what they are, I think the prospects of building an entire Warhammer town from scratch or even buying uh, the kits and painting them up. Prospects of that are pretty much nil. Uh, unless I suddenly find myself uh, divorced and unemployed. You might notice in this uh, in this pack that you get all these lovely little extra things like wanted posters and uh, signposts for the actual place and this uh, poster says wanted dead or alive the Perry twins extremely dangerous so uh, well, there you go if anyone remembers the Perry twins they're still around I think still doing their thing sure what I'm going to do with uh, 30 or 40 odd buildings. I uh, have a beginnings of a plan which may or may, or may not ever actually occur depending on what time and uh, work and uh, the effects of coronavirus on work have on my recreational space. But for the time being, fuck it, I'm just going to make these models and have some fun. Some basic instructions in this for people who have not uh, previously been acquainted with uh, paper craft. Um, yeah, the usual word of warning modeling knives are sharp and must be used with all due care. Keep your hands free of the cutting area. And so on. So I think uh, model kits of this era kind of expected people to have. A little bit of basic competence and common sense. You can see that in the way the instructions are written through the uh, through the manual. So you know the instructions set for um, uh, for the stable is the stable is a simple building constructed in the normal manner. That's very informative. Uh, because of its length, it's a good idea to incorporate reinforcing fillets into the roof and fasten cross strips, 
across strips of card underneath to keep the balls taut. But of course it doesn't show you how to do that. You expect it just to figure it out for yourself because you're not a complete fucking idiot. And you presumably have had some experience with hobby before. One of the things I've noticed with this kit, having just made some reference to not being a complete fucking idiot when you're building these things, is that sometimes the design doesn't seem quite right. And it suggests that you need to do a little bit of uh, adjustment to get the pieces to fit. But I think on balance that only happened maybe once. And it lured me into a false sense of superiority turned out a couple of occasions when I made adjustments to make it fit properly the way I thought it would be, I actually fucked it up. So I'd like to blame that on the beer and uh, general fatigue of late night hobbying, but I think what it tells you is that the, uh, the kits are actually pretty well designed. The guys who made these things knew what they were doing. than others. One of the things I'm doing while I'm cutting these out is I'm, I'm cutting the angles a little bit differently to what they do, which is not necessarily a design improvement, but it just makes it easier for me to find where I've got to do my folds when it comes to scoring and folding these things because I'm basically lazy and uh, I don't have a lot of spare time so I'm whipping through these things most nights so if you um, if this is nothing on the back and these are not pre-cut card and uh, I don't know if the original car stock buildings were pre-cut or not actually but if they were it would have saved an awful lot of fussing about <coughs> but because they're not pre-cut that I'm messing around with, um, you've got to um, score a line uh, on the fold point before you fold it, and the easiest way to score that line is with a ruler and a ballpoint pen that you can apply some pressure to, and That means aligning your uh, ruler correctly on the back side of this document. So you need reference points. So I, um, I cut these things at an angle so you end up with a little point. And I know that when I turn this over, if I align my ruler with that little point and draw from that point to that point, then I'll score the correct place and then I can fold that tab with some confidence that I'm folding in the right place. And 
Okay, what do we got here? Emperor Maximilian, somebody or another, the fourth, slept here in 1346 AI. Surplus crap card. Okay, this says warning the infamous Stockian Acro burst and some other crap I can't really read. Something about being insane, I think. I've messed around with papercraft buildings a couple of times before and I've actually got a new appreciation of them that I didn't used to have back when it was all by the expensive uh, Citadel kit or uh, build your own bloody thing out of foam core and whatever you're using. These papercraft kits they photograph really well when you're taking photos of your uh, your battle reports or your army. And the trick seems to be basing them in a way that complements the table, so they seem to be more embedded in the table rather than just being a bit of a bit of paper plopped on top. <clears throat> Building involves an overhang, which I know from a previous uh, building from the same series is a bit of a bloody nuisance to make, but that's okay. I once had one of these bastards roll off a table while I wasn't paying attention, and of course it fell off tip first and speared me right in the ankle. Left it wobbly in there, hanging off the bone. That was unpleasant. One of the best things about papercraft buildings is that uh, once you've got them, if you stuff something up, all you got to do is print out that one page with the piece that you bug it up. It's not like you lose the um, item forever. And there's a model of building you particularly like. Once you've got the file, you just print out as many as you like. And there's a chap whose name escapes me, will come back to me probably in a very inconvenient moment later when it's of no use. 
Dave Grafham, I think maybe his name is. He does some really brilliant uh, paper craft building sets. And a friend of mine bought a bunch and he's, he's done them up. He glued off his foam pool. Um, I've got a few of the demo ones he was releasing for free and uh, one of those designs is a simple little hovel. I thought, well, this is quite nice. So I printed out half a dozen of the things and I put them together and based them up. And you've got the beginnings of a hamlet. It makes for a proper bit of uh, scenery. It's put a bit of scattered terrain around it and you've got a quite a nice little patch. Uh, the Dave Graffer models are um, uh, they're beautiful. They're done on a computer, straight to PDF, I would think. And um, I mean, you can tell the difference in the way that all the textures are drawn up. Scratch is a very different itch to this old, um, uh, presumably uh, the ink sections were done at a uh, um, quill, I would think, actually. And a lot of this stuff is done with a paintbrush. So you're drawing with inks and so on. Here's a good example. You can tell all of the grain work of that wood. Each of those lines is hard hand drawn, probably with a um, some sort of fine point quill, which gets a tight ink line. So they've gone over the top of it with uh, the various different colours, blended them together with translucent inks. This is one that's. Uh, which actually I fucked up. I've got to print this one off again and do it properly. Um, but yeah, those Dave Graffin ones are great, but they look different. So I think I'll put all of this um, Warhammer Townscape items together in, in one terrain collection. And uh, when I get more Dave Graffin figures, or uh, well, you know, papercraft models, which I probably will, because they're very good, then I'll um, probably do them as a separate batch. Maybe have one Dave Graffham Town and one uh, one Warhammer Townscape. <clears throat> Alrighty. So this is a good example of the bloody nuisance that occurs when you um, don't have things pre-cut. I've got to figure out where the fold line is, which is here. I've got this wrong on one of them because the graphics aren't always done neatly enough. Got to mark the back of the fucking thing. I did try cutting the edge in order to mark it, but that's not not an improvement over this approach and it just cuts your bloody paper and opens it to uh, risk of tearing. So uh, i just use a steel ruler. You could use any ruler really. And a ballpoint pen because the ballpoint allows you to really press into the paper stock. And it gives you a very tight fold. And you know, you could do these things by eye. I think I did on a couple and it was just so obvious you just fold the two points together at the opposite end of it, fold it across, but this just seems to get a tighter, cleaner fold. Suits me to do it that way. Chimney to this, which I didn't cut out already. I'll have to find that later. Chimneys are a remarkable pain in the ass to actually uh, cut out. They've got more bloody folds in them than the whole house combined. Scoring and folding with precision gets more important the smaller the pieces are. This that tight scoring is what gives it the definition and shape. You could use any pen for this, and it's also the ballpoint. You could use a roller ball, but it'd probably bust the roller ball. 
but for me, because I like fancy pens, I'm using a ballpoint. All kinds of weird decorative stuff on it, which I picked up from a museum in Taiwan. In a little gift shop right next to a fucking great big dinosaur display. Very good museum, actually. Though I did have that weird Australian abroad experience where uh, we went to um, the first of the museums that we visited, and their main installation was uh, Aboriginal bark paintings, which I'm sure is very exotic if you're. Uh, from uh, Taiwan, but having had a bit to do with um, that side of things in Australia, it did seem very weird travelling to the other side of the planet to see uh, bark paintings from your own country. Let's see how these fold up. So there's no need to. Uh, Use a ruler as a guide, if you've done the uh, scoring strong enough, it'll just bend very naturally along those lines. And there are other manufacturers of uh, paper craft out there, and um, I've come across a few examples over the years. I've printed out some, lost a few. Um, there's some Dungeons and Dragons related material. I've got no idea who made it, but it seems to be branded, so possibly uh, there's kits that will uh, be tailored to that market. I once found an educative package of a uh, American small town which had all the buildings you'd expect to find on Main Street, so you could build your own Main Street. I suspect they did not have games like Team Yankee in mind when they printed those, but I printed off a batch thinking that I might uh, I might use them for that purpose anyway. Perfect for I reckon for a um God what was that movie Red Dawn, Patrick Swayze and assorted others. Midwest America fighting off the uh, somehow extremely implausible Cuban military invasion of the southern US. But I do quite like that film. Team Yankee is... Uh, the Flames of War in general is the other game system I invest a lot in, aside from good old-fashioned Warhammer. And a few other games we have a crack at from time to time. But uh, Warhammer seems to be uniquely time-consuming, and uh, Team Yankee's not far behind that in terms of being a full-spectrum gamer adventure. Build your own terrain. You can buy it if you want, but it, it, it invites you to build your own terrain. Paint up your own armies, paint up another army. When you're done with that, paint up another army. <laughs> Trade in an army to buy another army if you don't have enough money to buy an army. I've traded in a few over the years to get, uh, get new armies. I like the uh, I like all aspects of gaming, not just the collecting. I quite like uh, making sure my uh, my own material is my own, done by my own hand. Something something about that's uh, uniquely rewarding when it's all on your own tabletop instead of being pre built, pre painted stuff.
might be able to hear the rain out there. They told us it would be a wet winter and it, um, well, it seems to be a wet spring, <laughs> that's for sure. And cold and wetter it is in my very dry, very warm part of the world. The more I understand why a country like England would come up with uh, miniature wargaming. This partly to make it clearer, clearer to mark the point, but also because sometimes if the uh, cuff is too tight, then the tabs interfere with each other. And uh, from a practical standpoint, it doesn't make much difference. But it's just one of those little things that irks me. Sometimes the alignment's not quite right on these, but uh, they come out a bit wobbly, that's okay. I'm sure the standards of construction in uh, old Warhammer land were probably not quite perfect. I've also got a whole lot of cardstock buildings that I've purchased from a company called uh, Metcalf, I think they are. <clears throat> They're actually manufactured for model railway sets. And they uh, print them onto um, cardboard. It's somewhat thicker than the average um, uh, cereal packet, for example. It's quite firm stuff. And they get textured by having different layers of this um, car stop to glue onto each other. But they're all pre-punched, not pre-cut, you've got to punch the bits out. The occasional cut, not much really. The windows uh, come in those kits on plastic. And they're absolutely beautiful. Um, for people who like to buy their terrain in high detail plastic and paint it themselves, yep, okay, it's a scratch is a different itch. But those Metcalf buildings also look great, and uh, if you look at some of my other videos for any of the um, World War Three stuff, uh, or even some World War One stuff, if I ever film any, 
Uh, those Metcalf buildings look fantastic on film. But yeah, those ones are more like what this townscape originally would have been packaged as in that you get a, a packet for 20 bucks. And it's got a, a whole lot of um, pre-printed bits on firm card of the right density to go with the instructions to construct the building in the particular way that it should be done. All pre, uh, pre-cut card. And I suppose it probably would have gone through an old-fashioned printer as well because uh, those things are still in operation for uh, some, some types of print run. <clears throat> God, this stuff's only 5.2%. I'm already feeling it. That's not right. That's what parenting does to you. <clears throat> Now this is the fiddly bit, because that's actually the overhang, so it's going to fold back and fold back again. So, I reckon I'm going to score a line directly along here. Last time I did one of these, I didn't measure it quite correctly and looked a bit funny. A bit puffy, actually. This is probably the only time I'll ever use guide marks on this um, mat that I'm using here. Don't really need cutting mats, but now that I've finally got off my ass and got one, Convenient. Okay, so that should buff up there nice and square. There we go. to how they laid all this out. I like to think it was for efficiency and not for a case of, oh crap, I should have photographed that, uh, that piece on a previous page. I better stick it in a later one, but you never know. The thing about doing everything analog is that the amount of time it takes to repair errors is always, always so much longer. Back in 88, the very idea that you could sell an electronic file online, send it to millions of people all around the world and sell it in different countries where people would just stick it in their computer, attach a high definition printer better than anything which was running at the time on that even old fashioned printing and bang out as many copies as you want. Share it even more easily than old-fashioned cassette tape. 
That's the sort of science fiction we were kind of dreamed of back in uh, back in our childhoods. Though it's nice, it gives this um, very old-fashioned uh, hobby kit a whole new breath of life. You can see what I mean by how bloody fiddly these uh, chimneys are. Of course, most buildings have a chimney. So I've probably done about 25 or so of these uh, fiddly fucking chimneys so far. And I've got another 5 or 10 to go. If you saw uh, my uh, part one and part two of rehabilitating the dark elves, uh, that project is still ongoing. But of course, I went and got distracted by well, some university work, uh, doing a little bit of study, and the same time the job's gone bonkers. And parenting continues to. Uh, require time be invested in the real world but I will be continuing that uh, rehabilitation of the dark girls I'm about 25 odd um, Corsairs that's what they're called 25 or so Corsairs sitting on my painting table at the moment I'm getting stuck into those bad boys in the near future This has been a uh, very satisfying distraction. When I mean, you're painting up a uh, army or a, a regiment or whatever you're doing, you can take, well, if you're like me and you're a slow painter, and you don't get a huge amount of time for painting, you can take a good couple of weeks to um, Go from kit, unassembled kit, or even a even an assembled unpainted kit, through to an end unit that looks uh, up to scratch. Whereas with these paper craft kits, you generally bang out a kit or two an evening, and uh, at the end of the evening, you can pop the uh, finished product down on the table, and uh, has a sort of immediate sense of. Uh, reward and it's very gratifying you know yeah you know in a therapeutic oh my god what a long day at work I need something to feel good about sort of way all right well now that's all the pieces cut and folded so I'll pull that away is the main joiner I use glue but I use tape after I've put the glue down 
just in order to uh, help reinforce it for the short term. That seems to be doing the trick. Dispenser, but I uh, ran out of that stuff. Haven't had a chance to get to the shops. Okay, well, I think I should do the big box first. Now, this stuff here is absolutely brilliant. For uh, paper craft kits, and I did have a whole bunch of these when I was doing all the Metcalf buildings up, but um, I can't find any locally anymore. I don't know if they stopped uh, selling it or what. So until I managed to find new stock, got very little left. So I'm using some adhesive roller tape for the time being. It's not as good, but it does the job. The main problem with the adhesive roller tape is that uh, it doesn't give you as much scope to adjust the join once you made it. So this is a bit requires a bit more care. Get the alignment exactly right from the get-go. It's not perfect when you're a few beers down into the evening. Oh, see if I can get that to work right. I just realized that there's a problem in my fold which is going to create a little bit of green on the corner there. But I can't be fucked fixing it. So if it bothers me later I'll get to it with a black text and I'll remedy that. not a perfectly aligned piece. It will do however. So rather than rip up the paper I'll just uh, reinforce my imperfection there and touch it up as needs be at a later date. Sometimes these things clog up a little.
these overhang bits are ever so slightly annoying to get to hold right because basically the paper wants to bounce around and go in different directions. Okay, so that's what we want it. I'm going to have to get in there with a craft knife and trim some of the perky bits on this at a later point. Buildings would be nice and simple to build, but as well as that one last little bit of shit that's real pain in the ass to get the fucking stick in the right place. No, it's, no, it's not glued properly at all. Okay. Unfortunately, my proper glue that I've got there is running out. I find that bulldog clips are brilliant for these kits. slip around a bit. I actually use the sticky tape to stop it slipping around a bit which is fine if you get it aligned properly in the first place. But the bulldog clips will hold it very reliably while you're sorting out everything else. And of course they don't damage the uh, Paper integrity like sticky tape and glue do if you have to pull those off and rearrange things. There we are. That's going to require a bit of touching up, but it'll do for now. It's going down altogether too well. Somewhere out there in YouTube land, there's probably a uh, professional hobbyist or uh, scale building maker or architectural model maker who's shaking their head at the dumb things I'm doing and all the shortcuts that I don't know about. If you are such a person, feel free to put some... Uh, Hints and, tips, hints and tips in the uh, comments section there. 
do a little help I can get, I think. Over time, sticky tape tends to decay and stop holding things together quite as well. So it's not really the main structural material for keeping this building in one piece, one piece over time. The glue will do that job. The tape just helps the glue stay in the right place or hold in the right place. There's our box frame. on next before I uh, before I do the um, fancy window bits now the roof I know from experience definitely needs the glue rather than the glue tape because the thin walls do move around a bit, you've got to adjust them as you attach the roof. And we're rapidly nearing the end of this uh, tube of glue. I suppose acridia or wood glue something a bit fancier perhaps glue stick might cut it at a pinch For my money I'll use these anytime I can actually find the bloody things in a shop One of the things with putting the roof on is because this does ultimately hold the uh, shape together. You want to make sure you get the building more or less square while you're attaching the roof. And it wriggles around some actually. So I actually use the mat with these corner sections here. So to align that. Try and keep it square. Press the roof down. You got to put these peak roof bits in properly because they wriggle around. And of course, you do that. Everything else shuffles out of place. It is a bit of an irritating process. These ones behaving a bit less than they usually do, actually. Get that end on. Make sure you leave enough room at the other end of the roof so that you don't. Uh, run out of space to pull the roof on. I've had a couple where the, the roof's been at an angle and you've got to peel off and start again. And you're going to muck around in here and straighten it out a bit more. I reckon we're nearly there actually. before the glue has properly cured. I 
it's very useful for making sure that all of the uh, paper surface connects with the other piece of paper so more of the glue gets into position. Let's see if my stumpy middle-aged fingers can get this thing in position. There we go. Now, that'll do. Pretty good, pretty much square. Close enough that when I draw it down to a base on the uh, tabletop or whatever, it'll, uh, it'll be okay. Right, chimney. most disproportionately fiddly bit of just about every one of these buildings. What is a good thing about Warhammer is that um, wonkiness is built into the design language. So if you screw up your build slightly and it's a bit out of whack, then it'll fit in just fine with the rest of the aesthetic. I'm just using tweezers on some of these smaller bits just to uh, press the paper together to make sure that it actually does connect with as much of the glue surface as possible and uh, you know, the more of the surfaces that touch then the more glue is actually holding it together of course so that seems to work for me. using this bit of paper down here as a drop cloth in effect so that uh, I don't glue up my table and then have random bits of uh, paper craft scenery stuck to the cutting table instead of sticking to the correct thing. to some folks and others that I really don't do this sort of thing professionally. I'm doing this strictly for fun and um, well I like to share. That's why I'm inviting you to watch this very uh, slow moving um, YouTube vision. Don't need that last little tag that's just going to create problems. Chimneys are another bit where you sort of need a bit of wriggle room, so you need the, the thickness of the proper glue rather than the tape. If there's any left. The roof's also quite flexible, a bit spongy, so uh, having a bit of thick glue helps overcome the effects of the wobbliness. Just take 
takes a moment for the stuff to cure. It does create a little bit of surplus. It needs to be scraped away. For the next few seconds, because this all has to be held down in place with the glue uh, cures. Tonight's exciting viewing is uh, you watching a bloke watching glue dry. refer to the instructions for a change. So this suggests it should be three shingles down and two shingles up. So about there. Whoa, <laughs> this is going out badly. There's little tabs of paper which are popping out already. And uh, I've used the um, in the tube instead of the stuff on the um, tape because partly for the same reasons as the chimney and partly because it's just a fiddly bit this is going to muck around on me so I need to hold it I need to be able to adjust it as it moves it around Just pressing the paper from the inside of the uh, roof to firm it up behind where I'm pressing this thing on. Oh, God. Just again to make sure that the paper connects over as much surface area as possible. Of course, I've gone and adjusted the positioning while I was at it. And you know what, it occurs to me, now that I've fucked around with this for a little bit, that there's this lovely little pencil line along there, which tells you where the thing's supposed to be joined. Might take note of that while gluing the next one on. Alright, we'll see how much glue I've got left.
I think on the Dave Graham website where you can get all the um, you know these model kits plus the free demos. Uh, he's also got a uh, set of instructions and hints and tips for this sort of work for how to do it uh, to a higher standard. Very useful if you're going to be doing a lot of this sort of thing. It's going to need to be pressed on a bit just to make sure the surfaces get enough time to bond and make sure those tabs don't uh, pop up as paper is wont to do. It tends to want to unfold after you've fond it, folded it. Bits. Now I've moved this around a bit much. Okay. I could theoretically use the tape at this point, but this is almost the end of the building. And I don't want to uh, risk uh, the tape not connecting at enough points to actually hold. This is not the easiest build out of the, uh, the whole pack, all, uh, all 39 buildings if you count the uh, two individual <laughs> tents at the very end as being buildings, they certainly do. The most complicated one is actually involves a water wheel which I uh, got through building then realized I'd stuff something up so I need to reprint some materials and uh, have another go. That's uh, the building I showed you before. It's, um, there's two problems with it. One is that I uh, cut these bits short not realizing that it had to go all the way through to the uh, end of this piece. So that was my mistake. I uh, cut those bits off thinking, oh, they've made a mistake, I'll just fix it. And um, turned out they hadn't made a mistake, I just buggered it up. Um, which is a simple component of the building, actually, but uh, the building the water wheel is a pain in the butt. That, the, the water wheel actually came out all right. Uh, so that's probably the most complex building out of all the ones in this. Uh, this kit. The simplest building uh, you'd think would be the tents. Like, you know, literally, they built two, two tents. <laughs> you just fold them over and fold the ends together and you've got tents. But actually building the latrine was easier. So once I've bodged up the whole town and done it all as one big nice piece, which I'll probably do as either on uh, modular bits of board that can fit together in different configurations or um, maybe in one large diorama piece for the whole town but somewhere there will be a uh, outdoor shit house which I think is very generous because back in this era they probably didn't have outdoor shit houses I think they tended to do it in the street 
but you know, who cares? It's a fantasy world because they can uh, shit wherever they like. So one of the things I'm going to do once I've built all the buildings is I'm going to go through all the uh, Sorted silliness, all the different doors and the different uh, pieces. Uh, apparently, Mona Lisa is wanted to um, give you a lot of doors, a lot of random bits of graffiti and uh, signs to pin on walls. So, once I've built all the buildings, I'm going to go through all that extra paraphernalia and figure out what, if anything, I want to stick on what buildings and. Um, That'll finalise the various bits of character. Well, you know what? I reckon that's done. Oops. So that's one beer in about uh, more about an hour, hour and a half. A little bit of glue, a little bit of tape, and we have ourselves. Nice gabled building with that classic overhang over the street because people only pay taxes on the, uh, <laughs> bit of, the bit of the building that connects to the ground. So people used to build an overhang that would reach over the street in order to give themselves more floor space but um, not pay for the actual land. Uh, medieval towns are full of that sort of thing. So I reckon after a bit of mucking about, this has come together reasonably well. Good enough for my uh, personal tabletop standards. And um, I'll add this to the collection of some uh, 38 other buildings. And um, what I might even do, is print out a few additional items like hovels which might be useful to have a few of those around sort of thing that the peasantry would have so there might be a few extras in the town on top of uh, more substantial and unique buildings such as this one but that's it from me thank you for watching I think it's time to call it a night